Uh, I'm Steve Furtler, I'm a psychophysiologist working at the Liverpool John Bush University. Uh, just to explain what that is, I'm a psychophysiologist, that means I use physiological data to infer things about people's psychological states, so taking measures from the brain and the body. Um, what I'd like to talk about today is, uh, I guess, an applied branch of that that we call physiological computing. A physiological computing, which I just said, uh, basically involves taking live physiological data, psychophysiological data from a person and converting that to some kind of <coughs> controlling pump in order to enable novel forms of interaction with technology. So if you're using these signals in order to uh, say to substitute the most control or keyboard control, then you're using something like a brain computer interface. If we're using these signals to tell us something about the person's emotional state, so the computer can offer help, if you realize that the person is frustrated, then we'll talk about an effective computer system. And people can also collect this sort of physiological data in order to share things about their own lifestyle and also investigate things about their health as well. So what I'm going to do is talk about a couple of projects that we've been involved with just to give you some examples of how these interactions actually work and what kind of things they look like and what kind of issues they raise. The first thing I'm going to mention, this is from a project we did some years ago that was funded by the EU, the FET, called Reflect. And on Reflect we were tasked with doing something called a cognitive loop. So trying to create a system that monitors something about someone's cognitive state and does something about it. What we decided to do was to create a game, uh, an old-fashioned game like Tetris, something that's quite simple, and to drive the, the, the level of difficulty of that game using uh, EEG activity. So the idea here is that we have a loop, and the purpose of that loop is to maximize the motivation of the player, to give the player uh, the most engaging and exciting game that is possible, given the confines of the game itself. Now that begins really with uh, the theory, a uh, theory from psychology. This is a motivational intensity theory. And what this theory says, basically, is that uh, when people put, when a task becomes more difficult, people get more and more motivated up to a certain point when they realize that success is very unlikely and they give up. So you have kind of ramping up of motivation and then it falls off at that particular point. So we were interested in applying this concept and obviously design our computer game around it. And to, we, we kind of labeled these little zones along the way. So when demand is low and motivation is low, then we realize that the player is bored. We would like the player to be engaged. We would certainly like to, the player to be in an area that we call the zone. So this is the point just before people give up. Um, and we think this is where people are really enjoying the game the most. But we don't want to be overlooked either. So what we're now dealing with is a, it's a computer system that's kind of got the gender in mind. It's a computer system that's trying to program the state of the gamer and to put them into a certain frame of mind when they're playing the game. And it's doing that by controlling the level of difficulty of the game. And this being Tetris, it's quite simple to do that. We can just control the drop speed of the different shapes. Now, in order to decide what kind of measures we should use, because EEG is a bit complicated measure with lots of different slices on it that you can take. Uh, we've already done a few years worth of experiments using standard psychology working memory tasks. And we've been very interested in theta activity, that's EEG activity between four and seven parts, uh, frontal central area of the brain, right here. Uh, so then we did a number of experiments where we had people play Tetris. And we made the Tetris game very easy, or we made it so fast it was absolutely impossible to play, and we made it somewhere in between. This is what the data looks like. This is uh, a collection of, I think it's uh, 15 people playing Tetris. So what you can see is that feature activity intensifies at its most the highest level in that little bound. When the game is hard, but neither impossible nor too easy. So this is a state that we are now trying to get the Tetris to, to create. So in order to do that with the game, we, uh, we have a live uh, data processing pipeline. So it's taking the data from that site there, and it took some other measures as well, uh, and it's using that to control drop speed. Now the way we actually designed it was to do this on by making an adjustment every five seconds. So it's making adjustments all the time. And what we also decided to do was make, make small adjustments to drop speed every time. So when the game made an adjustment, the player would not normally notice it. But over a period of time, the direction of the game would become kind of quite clear. And the reason we did this was because we knew the community was going to get it wrong every now and again. So we wanted to kind of hide the error in a way. But we also wanted the way the game changed difficulty to be cumulative and smooth and not to be too jarring for the user. How well did it work? Well, it was really good at ramping up, not so good at pulling you back down again the other end because of this cognitive response. The really interesting thing about this loop that we have <coughs> is that what you have is 
signals from the brain talking to a computer, which is then talking against the signals of the brain without the real, real awareness from the person involved. So your brain is having a conversation with the computer, but you're only partially aware of that conversation. So what I think that kind of really demonstrates is this, is that we use an implicit monitoring of psychophysiology here to create an implicit interaction. The idea that you can interact with a computer that's actually the only interacting with the computer, which is a interesting, possibly scary idea, but it's not an interesting idea, right? Really. Now the next thing I want to talk about, a different project, uh, this is a project called ArtSense. And on the ArtSense project, we're working with the similar sort of system, working with loops again. We're trying to record psychophysiology, uh, but in a completely different setting. We're doing this in a cultural heritage setting. So we're talking about the way cultural heritage institutions provide information to the visitors. And what we're trying to do is to create a loop that effectively monitors the person's state when they're interacting with a uh, piece of audio or a certain exhibit or, or a movie or whatever. And we're trying to tag that experience and trying to say, we're trying to put a label on that experience and say what's actually going on. So this is quite different from the Tetris game. In Tetris it's nice because you've got an active game, the psychophysiological changes you see are actually quite strong. But when people are just standing up passively, looking at media, whether it's listening to music or whatever, the change is quite small in comparison. This is actually a lot harder to do. The other problem is, is that cultural heritage material, you know, it's interesting to some people, but it's not interesting to everybody. It's not, it's often not terribly provocative, so you don't get big, strong psychological responses. So, for this particular system that we had to build, we had to first scratch our heads and think, what kind of psychological states would we want to measure? And we talked about all kinds of things, like engagement and emotion and all these other things. But the thing we settled on is a construct called interest. Now, interest is a psychological state, or curiosity, if you like, is something that's not been heavily studied. And it's not been heavily studied because people aren't sure whether it's a cognitive state or an emotional state. So we saw this as a kind of vacuum, we kind of did some literature reviewing and so on, and we did a, a large survey to kind of ask people what they thought the interest was of the construct. And we came up with this, uh, I would call it a model, I call it a, a multi-dimensional kind of measure of interest. So we reckon that interest is composed of at least three th main things. First of all, something that we call complexity or comprehension, which is basically our cognitive response to the material. Do you understand it? Is it hard to understand? Secondly, it's the stimulation value of the material. Is it, is it, is it exciting in that sort of way, or is it, a, is it more boring in some sorts of ways? So we have our activation and arousal. And we also have emotional component, because we reason that material that provokes a strong negative or positive emotion will also be of, of interest to the person. So that were the concepts, and then what we did was map on some psychophysiological measures onto them. And um, we had a constraint here, because we're working in a museum where people walk around, we had to use ambulatory sensors. We couldn't use lots of wires like we were doing in the laboratory. So we had an ambulatory EEG system, that's just taking EEG from the forehead here, and we're interested in the electrocortical activation of the rostral prefrontal cortex, which is often involved in uh, novel problem solving and the intake of novel information. Activation and arousal is an easy one, we're just taking heart rate to skin conductance in order to measure that. And in order to measure valence, again, it was a tough, valence is a tough one to measure. Uh, we're using a measure that's been around in psychophysiology for some years now called frontal EEG asymmetry. And this basically says that uh, when your left frontal activation is higher than your right, then you're in a positive state, and vice versa for, for a negative state. Um, one of our partners in this project is a Museum of Decorative Art in, in Madrid. And in the Museum of Decorative Art, if you have across the top floor, then we've got the beautiful 16th century Venetian <coughs> kitchen. We've got this beautiful tile kitchen in there. And this was one of our main kind of case studies on the project. So we did a study in Liverpool where we basically projected a whole wall view of this kind of fringe, this, this, this tile. And we had people wired up so they could stand up and walk around and wearing all these sensors. And we played them four different sorts of audio stories about four different features of the, of the scene. And then afterwards, we said to them, tell us which two of the stories were the most interesting to you. And they, they didn't all choose the same two, they all chose kind of different things. And then so we have the data from the interesting stories, we have the data from the not so interesting stories for those people, and we basically put them through a classification system, a machine learning algorithm, a support vector machine, if someone's interested, and then we look at what kind of classifications emerge. This is a summary of our finding, these are kind of mean classification rates across uh, 15 people, I think. 
so as you can see, our activation measure, heart rate and skin conductors, it got it right three quarters of the time. But if we put complexity and activation together, so this was the EEG measure and heart rate stuff together, then it's getting it right 80% of the time, which is, which is a modest improvement. So these kind of classification rates are, I would say they're modest, I wouldn't like to make a big deal about them in that sort of way, but what you have to remember is that people are standing, just listening to audio information. It's a very low key, uh, very kind of uh, not thinking provocative sort of task. So we think that this is something that we can, that we can actually build. On. And the interesting thing that we talked to our partners in the museums about is that obviously museums have all kinds of metadata. They are tagged in all kinds of different ways, depending on the exhibit, period, and all those things. Now the reason we're doing this work is so that the type of information that the museum gives to the visitor can be personalised in order to make it interesting for them. You know that the level of interest is sustainable for the visitor. The other interesting thing about this is that if, for example, we collect data from someone and these tags are being dropped in real time and they're being put together with metadata labels, then say, for example, someone always is interested in the cognitive form or something like that, then you can start to build a profile of the person by exposing them to a wide enough range of media, a wide enough range of material. So that's an example, I think, of implicit monitoring. It's a different source of experience. So both of these pieces of work, on the collect and art sense, are really about creating the loop so technology can be more aware of the user and can do more things with the user. Now I want to talk about a different approach, which is much simpler in some ways, but it's about uh, using this data for the person themselves. Now, some years ago, uh, I ended up in a, I think it was a workshop event somewhere, and I had to come up with something quickly. And I came up with this concept of body blocking. The idea of body blocking being that um, you record the physiological data set from yourself, and then you collect that data over a long period of time. So, what happens when we collect that data over a long period of time? What can we do with that data? What kinds of things can we learn about ourselves from our lifestyle? Do we want to share that data on social media? What are the consequences of privacy of the person that we share that data on social media? And so on. So, being a typical professor, I'm very good at coming up with these ideas, but not so great on the practical point of view. Uh, so, it fell to my uh, colleague, Kyle Gilead. Uh, Kyle, rather heroically, a couple of years ago, wore a heart rate monitor for a whole year, uh, 24 hours a day, second days a week taking it off occasionally for comfort and for privacy. And what that gave us was a, a massive data set that we could then have a look, and then we could get to the public visualizing and what kind of things we could, we could learn from that. So this is a visualization of it. It looks very similar to the London Mercial, doesn't it? Like you just saw before, some sort of way. It's not, it's not a dynamic version. So what you're seeing here is days of the month on the vertical axis, hours of the day on the horizontal axis, and each of those little pixels is an hour's worth part of the world. And the white space is in the part of the to turn the sensor on. Now, as you can see, if you collect data over a long enough period of time, you start to see certain patterns emerge, and the patterns are kind of interesting. So what the blue one you can see on the left-hand side of that slide, that's how well Carl sleep. And it's also what time you to bed. So you can see those kind of things going on. Um, on the right-hand side, in the evening, you'll see a few orange, blo uh, orange blocks at the beginning. Carl's one of the blue ones. This is what you can see when he was going on. And what he did was, uh, he, he, if he wanted to, he tweeted his heart rate every, every few minutes. And like that. It was Twitter stream, this heart rate coming out. And on our research blog, we color coded the pages, so that our, our blog page changed color depending on what Carl's heart rate was doing. And you can kind of work it out, but it's also, you really needed to know what he was doing in order to understand what was going on with that. So, what did he learn from that? Well, one thing that amused me, at least anyway, is that there's a sound shot here where we we were aware. Because then we did sandwiches, they were cheaper. Uh, and so we found out what these sandwiches were doing to his heart rate, and kind of raising it almost as much as he were running, so he decided to uh, eat more healthily at lunchtime. So he picked up that sort of thing. He also picked up on things where, uh, you know, for example, you know when you've had a bad day, but seeing a stressful day visualized in this kind of way, here's a, a stressful, this is a typical day versus a stressful day. Uh, you can see what's going on, is that basically? He's not sleeping that well, his heart rate's still green in the middle of the night, and his heart rate's high during the day, and actually bed at 8 o'clock in the morning, I guess, when he finally wakes up and realizes all the stuff he's got to do that day. So it's kind of interesting to learn about, to, to quantify this sort of thing. And, um, and uh, I'll put up some web pages at the end. There's a, there's a talk that Carl did that's from Quantify Self, 
about his experiences of doing this. So the whole idea here is that you've got the big data set that's about a person that they are interacting with. And obviously what he's also doing is sharing this information so that we, as an audience, I guess, can share his experience and understand something about his experience. And we've also done a few things where we, uh, we went to see a scary play at the theatre and whilst each of us heart rate and that was going on. And there's stuff like we have shared experiences in order to, to add to that. So that's uh, another facet of that. So this is about implicit monitoring in psychophysiology in order to share experience. Now the last thing I'm going to talk about also comes from the ArtSense project. Uh, on ArtSense, one of our partners on ArtSense is an organisation called FACT, the Liverpool Commission for Art and Creative Technologies. And FACT wanted to commission a new piece of artwork as part of the, the ArtSense project. So they put out a tender and we gave a tender in the end to a group of collection of, 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 of artists called Manifest AR who create digital art and augmented reality. And the idea was that we would create some digital art and augmented reality that reacted to a person's psychophysiology in real time. Uh, so we, came, we did a number of projects with them, and the only one that has come through to fruition in that public rational experience is the show. The show is called Fact Inside Out. This is part of the show called Fact, part of the show called Fact Inside Out that opens next Thursday in Liverpool. And the piece I'm going to talk about is called Biomere Skelters. What well, Biomere Skelters involved is interactive augmented reality and an element of, of gamification in a way of trying to get people to self-regulate. So this is this <coughs> I think summarizes what Biomere Skelters is about. So Tariko Thiel and Will Pappenheim are the artists who came up. It's got this idea that people walk through the streets of Liverpool and they spawn plants, trees, effectively in the in the web. So they're spawning trees that are walking through, through Liverpool. And obviously you can view these trees on your smartphone or on, the, on a tablet. Now the idea is, is that we're also monitoring the heart rate. And if your heart rate is not too high while you're walking, and it is not too low either, you get this kind of sweet spot in a way, then you plant more and more trees if you're walking at a certain speed and managing to keep your heart rate within a certain range. Why would you want to do that? Well, the idea is quite simple is that to me cooking with this idea that in Liverpool you have native trees, like the little trail back here, and you have these mutant trees, the trees on the right. And people compete into two teams and they have to outplant the area of Liverpool. Some planted mutant trees and some planting native trees that they can then kind of compete about. So the way this works is that people walk around Liverpool in guided groups. Uh, so this is uh, an active fact. We were in about twice a week or something like that. Uh, and people walk through Liverpool, they plant these trees, they can look at them in their augments, and we could also interrogate a map of the area, you can see who's out planting who by looking at the map as well. So this is really another spin on the body block right here, if you think about it. But it also gives us this idea of uh, something I've already said several times today, that this data is being created all the time. And it's about leaving data trials in, in real physical space. Um, so the idea here is implicit monitoring is used for I guess an act of creative self-regulation in a way, to try and keep people in that sort of state. Um, so, the things I wanted to leave you with really is this idea of physiological computing, which may be new to some of you, and it's the idea that we do implicit monitoring of psychophysiology, and in that by doing this implicit monitoring of psychophysiology, we can create some interesting types of interactions, we can maybe type passive experience, we can share our experiences and understand things about our own lifestyle, and that to an extent uh, we can also indulge in acts of creative self-regulation when paired with the right technology. Uh, just before I end, uh, there's some websites here. The first one, if you're interested in the academic papers, on my research <coughs> website. We have a blog site, which uh, we haven't done anything with for a long time now, actually. But, uh, but there's a lot of material on it that we've already amassed for workshops and so on. And here's some links for the two projects I mentioned. So we were interested in applying this concept in order to design our computer game around it. And to, we, we kind of labeled these different zones along the way. So when demand is low and motivation is low, then we realize that the player is bored. We would like the player to be engaged. We would certainly like to, the player to be in an area that we call the zone. So this is the point just before people give up. Um, and we think this is where people are really enjoying the game the most. But we don't want to be overlooked either. So what we're now dealing with is a, it's a computer system that's kind of got the gender in mind. It's a computer system that's trying to program the state in order forms of interaction with technology. So we're using these signals in order to, uh, 
I say we'll substitute the most control, the keyboard control, and using something like a brain computer interface. If we're using these signals to tell something about the person's emotional state, so the computer can offer help, if we realize that the person is frustrated, then we'll talk about an effective computer system. And people can also collect this sort of physiological data in order to share things about their own uh, lifestyle and also investigate things about their health as well. So what I'm going to do is talk about a couple of projects that we've been involved with just to give you some examples of how these interactions actually work and what kind of things they look like and what kind of issues they raise. The first thing I'm going to mention, this is from a project we did some years ago that was funded by the EU, the FET, called Reflect. And on Reflect we were tasked with to do something called a cognitive loop. So trying to create a system that monitors something about someone's cognitive state and does something about it. What we decided to do was to create a game, uh, an old-fashioned game like Tetris, something that's quite simple, and to drive the, the, the level of difficulty of that game using uh, EEG activity. So the idea here is that we have a loop, and the purpose of that loop is to maximize the motivation of the player, to give the player uh, the most engaging and exciting game that is possible given the confines of the game itself. Now that begins really with uh, the theory, a uh, the theory from psychology. This is a motivational intensity theory. And what this theory says, basically, is that uh, when people put, when a task becomes more difficult, people get more and more motivated up to a certain point when they realize that success is very unlikely and they give up. So you have kind of a ramping up of motivation and then it falls off at that particular point. Okay, that's uh, I'm Steve Furtler, I'm a psychophysiologist working at the Liverpool John Mosh University. Uh, just to explain what that is, I'm a psychophysiologist, that means I use physiological data to infer things about people's psychological state, so taking measures from the brain and the body. Um, what I'd like to talk about today is, uh, I guess, an applied branch of that that we call physiological computing. A physiological computing, which I just said, uh, basically involves taking live physiological data, psychophysiological data from a person. And converting that to some kind of <coughs> control input in order to enable 